Hello, my name is Lynn Wilson, and I'm thrilled to be able to have another chance to talk about the hard questions in church history in combination with our Come Follow Me sections. These sections are some of my favorites, not only because of their content, but because we have a revelation to Emma. And we have so many questions about Emma, and wonderful information has been um, pouring out in the last few years as more research has been done. And I am thrilled to be able to have an opportunity to focus on her today. The first thing that I wanted to remind us of is we just finished the organization of the church in April 6th in 1830. And then if Joseph goes back down to Harmony, where his wife had been waiting for him, and then by June comes back up to Fayette, um, the hundred miles approximately. I don't know exactly if Google Maps is a good estimate for these kind of things, but as they return to Farmony, Harm, as they return to Fayette, the family um, there opens up their home again for another church conference. And these sections are in that context of this next church conference. It was on June 9th. There is now 30 members of the church rather than six to nine. We also have many more people attending the conference, just like they did at the organization. But this is when the sacrament is offered, confirmations are given, and um, priesthood ordinations are held, prophecies, visions. It was a wonderful conference, and it gives me great hope for my church worship, because many times I feel like my own private worship is the time that I feel the Spirit the greatest. And yet we know when two or three are gathered in the Lord's name, that's when His Spirit can be present. And if we come together focused in our worship, I am not suggesting that we all need to have visions, but I do believe that we can all have the spirit of revelation in our heart, which is the spirit of prophecy, which is, according to John the Revelator, the testimony of Jesus Christ, like we talked about before. But the main hard questions that I want to focus on today is Emma's young life, her background, her family's life. Um, hopefully, we'll have another chance to talk about the Relief Society organization, even though there isn't a section to it. I'm just going to sneak it in when we get to 1842. But there's so many questions that we have about Emma. Most of them are about her later time in life. I'm sure you've asked, um, why didn't Emma come west? Um, why was there a difficult relationship between Emma and Brigham? Why was Emma concerned about the property? Why don't we know much about Emma's family? Why did Joseph's family all that join the church and Emma's did not? You know, there's so many little details about these lives that we don't know, but that would help our understanding of not only the, the, their relationship, the prophet and, and Emma, but also understanding our relationship with each other. I feel like understanding the family life of the prophet is so helpful for all of us to not feel too bad for having challenges and um, shortcomings and opportunities for growth. Um, the idea of the rough stone rolling that Joseph called himself, I'm sure included a lot of, of those re relationships in his, in his family life. I don't know about what your hard questions are. I wrote up a few here, um, but there are so many more. I just wanna focus though on her early days she was born on July 10th, 1804, so she's a little bit older than Joseph. He is a December baby, December 23rd. We always have a birthday party for him on December 23rd in my family, and um, he's born in 1805, and she's in 1804, so they're about the same age, and she has a nice long life, unlike her husband's who was cut short, and dies on April 30th of 1879. I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the details of her life, and then I want to step back in time and go to her, her parents and her family. She's born in Susquehanna County in the little teeny town of Harmony. Her dad actually was um, one of the first two um, white settlers in that area. It was completely filled with um, Native Americans at the time that he arrived. But he, she meets Joseph when... Um, he is working down in Pennsylvania and in 2005, sometime in that autumn. Um, Joseph meets her dad in November, so we've got that date, but we don't know exactly when in the autumn he met Emma for the first time, or Emmy, as she was called. He was um, boarding at Isaac Hale's um, 
he had an old log cabin that he wasn't using at the time, and he turned into a boarding house, and that's where he was boarding, and they assume that um, there's a few references that Emma was there helping in this boarding house, and so we don't know if she was cooking or, or in, in charge of people who were cooking or what her relationship was, but probably in conjunction with that is where um, the two met that autumn in 25. And just to put things in context, remember Joseph's vision of Moroni is 23, the first vision of Moroni, and he doesn't get the plates until 27, so he meets Emma right in the middle of those four years of t divine tutoring. On January 18th, is in 1827 is when they're married, when they elope in South Bainbridge. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. That summer, um, they are living up in the Palmyra, Manchester area with this Joseph's parents, Lucy and Joseph Sr. in their um, home. And Lucy has the courage, it's been months now, to write her parents for her clothes and her things and her cow and uh, seeing, opening the doorway again for communication. And they invite her to come back home if she, she, they would like to move there. So um, she stays, they both stay, Joseph and Emma stay, of course, through the September meeting with Moroni. And Emma is there as um, in the wagon when Joseph finishes his interview with Moroni. October 30th is um, when uh, Alva, Emma's big brother, comes with a wagon to take them home down the 140 miles or so to Harmony, and they have to carry the plates with them. We talked about the barrel of beans a, a few weeks ago on that one. By December 1st, they have arrived in Harmony, and Emma is in her first trimester of her first pregnancy at that time, and so the traveling was, was tricky. Early in 1828, she acts as a scribe for the Book of Mormon. And then, by the time 1830, when this revelation is given, she is commanded again to write for Joseph in section 25. And she then is becoming a scribe on the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. But her parents, this is interesting, her mom, Elizabeth Lewis, actually had relatives 140 years before who were on the Mayflower. And her dad, um, Isaac Hale, comes family comes over they spell their name a little differently at that time held but they he came over as an their family came over as indentured servants in 1835 uh, through the male line and then established himself in this country and stayed so they both have a long um, history of being in America the Hale family the Hale family settled in Connecticut and um, We'll talk more about how they work their way down to Pennsylvania. And forgive this picture, but I didn't have any kind of a photograph of Elizabeth <laughs> so and Isaac. So I just came up with this one. Uh, but you can see their birth dates here. And um, Elizabeth was Isaac's sweetheart, even though they had been apart for a while. Um, maybe I should talk about their, their romance here. But no, I think I'll go into Isaac's life first. So um, they move up um, as a family. The Hale um, family moves from Connecticut up to Vermont, and they go, go to Wells, Vermont. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that in 1791, Vermont is open as a place for um, members of the United States, citizens of the United States, to move up as a, as a state. And you have this enormous influx of 300% of population increasing in Vermont, and that's when his family leaves Connecticut and, and goes up to Vermont. And he actually stays on his grandfather's Ward's farm, his mother Elizabeth Ward's um, dad's farm, and helps out there in his teenage years. But at age 17, he enlists and is able to serve in the Revolutionary War. So we have Joseph's grandparents serving um, their country in the war and Emma's family doing it. They're great patriots. They have a love of freedom. They have a love of their country. And they um, uh, fought directly to for, in the War of Independence. However, Isaac at this time has left um, Vermont to come down here, but he's already um, fallen in love. and. His grandfather, Isaac Ward, dies that same year and gives his grandson, who had been living with him, ownership of his farm as long as he takes care of his widow, his grandmother. So at age 17, he begins 
um, farming, his own farm or his grandfather's farm, with the additional responsibility of his grandmother. Now, we don't know exactly when his grandmother died, but four years after he receives this, the grandmother um, is no longer mentioned, and Isaac gives or arranges for part of the property to go to one of his uncles. And so we assume that the grandmother has died because Isaac then leaves town. And he starts, uh, this 21-year-old young man, 22, starts exploring um, upstate New York. Um, and by 24, he goes down and starts exploring the Susquehanna River Valley. And he falls in love with it. It's absolutely beautiful, just over the border of New York into the northern part of Pennsylvania. And it's very rugged. I mentioned he's um, one of the first white people, one of two, uh, the first explorers in that area. And he is able to claim a lot of land. Now, I don't think he got all 620 acres right off the bat, but he received a lot. You know, he was able to, he was industrious and he probably had some money from the exchange of the farm up in Vermont. And um, he becomes a trapper as well as a hunter. He was an expert marksman, they say. And he was well known in the community because he had been there so early, everybody who comes in sort of has to take their um, permission to come and their relationships with him. And he's a good man. And he's um, put in as the assessor and a supervisor and a collector, um, probably of taxes. <laughs> we also see that he's um, taking, um, we know about Joseph and Emma's date because of the tax date. So we know that he's a good record keeper. Um, he was also an innkeeper. As I mentioned, he has this, um, he initially builds this farm um, log house down close to the river. And before he builds a very large, beautiful frame house, a uh, few um, yards, quarter mile away or something. It's pretty close. But he becomes an excellent fur trader and he sends his goods downstream to the larger cities, um, Pennsylvania, and becomes quite wealthy. And in fact, he's, he becomes the most wealthy man in the community. Um, but he goes back up at age 27 to find his sweetheart, Elizabeth, and, and marries her. And I hope he made many trips between now, between <laughs> age 27 and 21 when he left. I, I don't know the details of the romance, and I um, don't even have an accurate picture. But forgive me for um, plagiarizing on these other people's pictures. I just wanted you to imagine in your mind um, this um, young couple as he comes up and sweeps her away and takes her down to Pennsylvania where he's established an area where he wants to make his home and she's willing to go with him. In that small log home, eight of their nine children are born and um, he begins with the smaller portion of about 150 acres before it starts growing. And I just don't know how fast and how rapid that number came. But as you recall, we talked about um, Martin Harris receiving an inheritance of land. And he received from his um, father a large portion, which he then grew to 320 acres. And then we now see Isaac Hale with over 600 acres. It's, it's really uh, amazing to see how much land these people acquired, considering now as we live in our little postage stamp size lots and um, apartments later on in the nation's history, depending on where we live. But during these times of industry and growth, um, the family was very close and most of the children all remained in the Harmony, Pennsylvania area. And that is another reason why I think it became very hard for Emma to leave. And, um, but she followed the spirit, she followed her husband, and, and they left. As you can see from this map from the church, there are um, four or five points that are significant to us. First of all, of course, the Susquehanna River and the home of the Hales, the, the wooden home. And then there is... Um, the home where Isaac let Emma and Joseph move into, which Joseph eventually purchased for $200, his 13 and a half acres. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I didn't, I didn't understand what 620 acres were. I, I've lived on an acre of land before. I have a, a little bit of understanding what a, a, a half of an acre and a third of an acre is from my backyards but over the years. But this is approximately just a little under a square mile. 
of, of land that he has. And as a hunter and a trapper, you can imagine how, how much he could have done there. But it's a very wooded area. For those of you who have been able to go down there recently, the church has done a wonderful job, and it's definitely worth saving your pennies and having a church history tour um, with your family or with your friends uh, going from upstate New York. Actually, start in Sharon, Vermont, and just come all the way down to this area here on the East Coast. It's absolutely beautiful. And... Um, the family grew, and they are blessed with these nine children, Jesse, David, Alva, Phoebe, Elizabeth, Isaac, Emma, or Emmy, Tyrell, and Reuben. And according to the records, Emmy was the favorite child. And her father especially um, found her just beloved. And they have a very close relationship, which is another reason why I think it was such a difficult decision for her. And it also refers to the level of sacrifice that she had to make in order to, to leave her dear family. But she was born in the wooden house before they moved over to the large house, but very few memories of, of this home. Most of her memories are of the very large home. And when Lucy went to visit Joseph and Emma after they were already into their um, log cabin, and she came and met the Hale family for the first time, she referred to th this home as a mansion with every convenient appendage necessary. I, I just love that for a woman who started her marriage with plenty of money. Remember, she had $1,000 in her dowry and 500 from her um, income um, to begin their married life. They, they would have been set for um, if it had not been unfortunately um, squandered with, but that was yester, uh, uh, yesteryear's talk. We talked about that in January, and now we're here in, in March. But the Hale home um, was the most lovely home in the neighborhood, and the inside was exquisite. When Joseph first came courting Emma, this is um, a reproduction of what things looked like. And Joseph and Emma and Lucy mentioned that there was paper on the walls, and wallpaper, obviously, but an evidence of the of the wealth rather than painting, and the colors were vibrant, and um, it was a large home, and the wealth was demonstrated by the clothing that was worn, also by the by the women, and um, as a hunter, there was plenty of lovely things to go around because he had enough money as well for the women in his home. But th they are so new in this area and it's so young to growth that they have to travel six miles before they find a church as a family. And there's Daniel Buck's church. They're um, attending for several years until he starts practicing, quote, unorthodox practices. Now, I'm getting this information from Mark Staker's book on Kirtland. And He's just a fabulous scholar. Um, he works for the church history department. But if you want to learn about Emma and this area, Mark Stakers, you're a great resource to go to. And that'll all be in my handout. And you can get some of these footnotes there. But um, while they are um, between um, Daniel Buck's church and looking for another because of his unorthodox practices, a revival comes into the area, a religious revival, as we talked about for several weeks before. And two times the county's population shows up in 1807 for this Methodist revival. And just to refresh your memory, in case you haven't um, got your Methodist doctrine down, I just want to remind you that um, this has they were so offended by this other church that the Methodists chose to meet in their home. The Methodist religion is not one that had their own buildings. They didn't have chapels. They were this um, Western migration of um, itinerant preachers. All you had to have was a Bible and a pony and, and you were on your way and you were called as soon as you had a testimony, as we talked about before. And so they gathered in people's homes if it was not warm enough weather to meet outside. And so the Methodist meeting place in Harmony became the Hale home and many were welcomed in there. This revival was very impactful on their family. The mother is baptized into the Methodist faith, and her their uncle becomes a Methodist deacon. Now, we had talked before about, uh, I just barely mentioned that you could become a Methodist minister or preacher just by having a witness of the Spirit. But to become a deacon, you're a couple levels up, and that is a permanent paid minister. And at that time, they were paid about $40 a month. 
as their um, income. So put that in perspective of what Lucy started the wedding with, with this ten thousand uh, or this one thousand um, dollar um, dowry plus her five hundred. Anyway, you can see that. Just do the math. It's it's pretty easy to see what this meant from where she was to um, what happened later on in the Smith family. But this is the Hale family, and Isaac. Um, years later, well after this, because at this Methodist revival, Emma's, Emmy's only um, um, three, years, three years old. So, but she is raised in this environment and um, is a sincere Christian and prays for her dad outside in the woods and near the home. And her father overhears her praying and knows that the mother has been converted and, and wishes that her dad would come unto Christ and receive the um, cleansing power of the atonement in his life and serve Christ with all his heart. And as the Papa Isaac Hales hears sweet Emmy praying for him, his heart is softened. He has a witness of the spirit. He becomes converted and is a devout Methodist from that point on. They also, in addition to having their own group of locals meeting in their home each Sabbath, about once a month would have a traveling itinerant preacher come and speak in their home, which would then bring in more crowds of people. Um, this is prior to the rise of Methodism across the nation. You know, this is before 1830. And in that early years of the 1800s, the nation, it, remember, as we talked about before, is saturated in Calvinism. They, the major faiths are Congregational, Presbyterian, Baptist, and Episcopalian, and it's not until 1850 that we see that flip where Methodism is, is on the top. But because Harmony is this new area, it's opening up to the West, that's where you always see the Methodists coming through and, and taking rise, and then this, Western, this Northern area of Pennsylvania then becomes one of the early Methodist strongholds so that by 1850, um, we have Methodist as the number one faith across the nation. But one reason why I think Methodism was so appealing to early Americans is because we are now an independent people and you can choose your faith. You can choose whether or not you want to speak and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the Methodist faith coming from the inspired, I believe, inspired leaders of the Wellesley brothers in England denounce unconditional election. You are not born good and bad. You are not born as the 144,000 elect. You can, you can work on it and, and more people can receive it. And, and then uh, secondly, you cannot just persevere just because you're born good. Um, you actually have to live Christ's teachings and follow his commandments in order to receive God's grace in your life. It, it's not enough to have a one-time experience. And this was the um, changes that m these wonderful um, Methodists were going back and forth with their um, Calvinistic roots that came over with the Puritans and so many other pilgrims of that first 17th century Americana that changed and um, of course, we know that in our faith, within the first vision and, and Moroni's visit, Joseph learns that all five of these are wrong. Um, but let's talk about Emmy. She loved physical activity. She grew up canoeing and horseback riding. She loved sleigh riding. She was very independent. Her parents sent her away to a private girls' school since she was so bright. And we think that that's where she received her medical training. She had... Um, she went to this group of this school of thought. You know, there's lots of different medical ideas and medical training is not like we know it as today. But this one school that she focused in on was very much in favor of having hot steam in the area of, this, of the sick patient. And so Emma often chose to put a bed in the kitchen. And even when she stays at other people's homes, like um, later on when they're in Kirtland, she chose to ask if they could have their bed in the kitchen um, when she has the twins that are sick with pneumonia. She wants, she's right down there in the kitchen and she keeps boiling water going all the time. And because she had this training, she often had an apprentice living with her. And almost the entire marriage of Joseph and Emma um, after their harmony years includes a young girl or someone in the home who is being trained in her in this um, medical field, um, these ideas. And there was a lot of, of 
I think, good ideas coming from it. And when you go back and look at it, if you want to study it more, um, you can see that there's ideas that even today have been um, proven to be accurate w with the scientific method. And that m medical training is a blessing to her her whole life, but I think it also makes it very, very hard on her to not to have lost more than half of her children because she knows better in her mind and the prophet could have healed them in her mind. So it, it, it's very difficult. Also, when she was away at this private boarding school, there's some evidence that she received a teaching certificate. You know, it's really hard when someone says, oh, yes, I knew Emma. She had her, she, she taught school. Uh, so we're, we're piecing together secondhand reports and possibly she received a school certificate. Um, we do not know of a specific time when she was teaching, however. Um, but that's just a second or third hand account. So I've included it here. She was somehow involved in her dad's inn, whether she was the accountant or the uh, manager or actually the cook. She was an excellent cook and she was very good at cooking for large crowds. And we think that perhaps she re she gained this at her dad's inn in um, the late twenties when Joseph was there as well. She owned two cows and she made her own cheese and she sold her cheese. And um, we, they found evidence of these cheese plans. And when her, she asks her dad for her goods, um, he says, yes, your cow is still here or your, your, cow, your cows are still here. They were milkers. Um, she managed her own financial accounts with not only her um, medical work, but in her um, cheese making. She was an excellent housekeeper. She owned her own furniture. She asks her dad after she's eloped, may I have my furniture? Um, I don't know if they were Christmas presents. <laughs> Obviously not Christmas presents. That was a joke. But uh, I don't know if they were gifts from her dad or if, if she had earned the money and, and purchased them on her own. Um, she was very musical. And in fact, there's some evidence that she was even in charge of making a hymnal for their little group that met of the Methodists in her family's home and that she gathered hymns together for that. And that was a love for her. And she loved singing. Um, she acted as Joseph Scribe as I mentioned before, but in those days, the work of a woman was so difficult. It was at great sacrifice that she would leave um, the making of a home, um, the food and the, I just, I want to even just spend a whole day on what was involved in woman's work at that time. There's so many things that I take for granted, starting with running water and um, toilets, let alone refrigeration and candles and electricity, you know. But she um, believed that it was part of her calling. She believed that it was part of Joseph's calling. And she did take time away from her extremely long days to um, scribe for Joseph, and she had nice penmanship. As And then later on in her life, which we won't talk about today very much, she becomes the president of the Relief Society in 1840, the first Relief Society in 1842. This cheese making um, was well enough known that it became quite a source of income. So independent of her father's, she had money, and she was used to that um, and I think that's one reason why she was independent. And as I think of the sacrifice that she made to marry Joseph and um, her parents' concern about Joseph, a lot of it was a financial concern. Now, in this area, um, as more and more um, European bread people move in, they have rumors of an old Spanish silver mine being in one of these mountains that were just adjacent to the hills around the Hale property. And the Stoles um, decide, Josiah Stoll and Jason Tindwell, Judge Harper, Isaac Hale, and Joseph Knight all are interested in finding more about this. But the person who's really um, a go-getter on it is Mr. Josiah Stoll. And he travels, as we talked about before, up to get Joseph because he's heard rumors of this young man who can find gold in the mountainside. And it's when this group brings down Joseph and his dad. Um, they are not staying in the pretty, I have it as a white building here, but it's, it's um, the, law, the frame house. They um, then come and stay in the log cabin that was a little bit down closer to the river. And that's where they first meet Emma 
over this experience. But as we talked about before, um, Joseph sees it's a waste of time and talks Mr. Stoll out of doing it just in a matter of a few weeks. Within one month, they're completely stopped. And it was Joseph's ability to talk Mr. Stoll out of it. And But Mr. Stoll so admired Joseph and so liked his work ethic that that's when he hires him on. And so he stays in that area and gets to know Emma better and, and falls in love with her. Um, According to accounts, Joseph was a handsome young man, over six foot tall, with broad chest and shoulders, light brown hair, blue eyes, long thick lashes, bushy brows, and a, and a light beard. And these firsthand accounts that recorded seeing him and, and what he looked like um, probably did not look as handsome as some of the paintings do now because Emma knew him as a, la a day laborer. You know, he, he was not um, a wealthy man that would have been in her social circles. Um, according to George A. Smith, Joseph's cousin, who was a little bit younger but about his age, Emma was the most beautiful woman in the universe. And we also have other statements about her, which I love. Um, Emma, oh, I want you first of all to notice this, this painting. Now, obviously, this is a modern painting, but Emma por um, stood for a couple of different portraits, I think three different portraits, and then in her later life, we even have a photography of her. But only in one of those does she have the ringlets, and it was only for very, very special occasions, and so most of the time, she does not have ringlets, and a woman never cut her hair in those days, and so you would buy those um, out of horse hair or uh, animal hair or else women who did cut their hair, but it was for socially... Uh, respectful people, you did not cut your hair. And then you clip them into your hair. And um, obviously, in, um, this artist is remembering that most of the time she did not wear those in her hair. Um, but in Emma's account of their relationship, she had, um, refers to the time when she went up to visit her sister. It's in January, and she gets in the sleigh, and her sister's 18 to 20 miles north. Um, as she goes up to the area, by this time, Joseph is working for Joseph Knight, and he went back and forth between just over the border in New York and down to see Emma. They were recording, and so as Emma comes up to see her sister, I'm sure she intended in part to visit her her handsome quarter, Joseph. But on this visit, as Emma comes up, she says, I had no intention of marrying when I left home. But during my visit to Mr. Stoll, your father visited me then. And being importuned by your father and aided by Mr. Stoll, and Mr. Knight says, I was the one that talked him into it. So you hear different sides of the story at different times, talked Emma into it. Um, and we urged me to marry her and preferring to marry him to any other man I knew. I consented. So there's her side of the love romance, preferring to marry him than any other man. I believe she was following the, the spirit of God. And so they elope. And um, she chooses to go to South Bainbridge, or they choose to go to South Bainbridge, which is just a little further north than Coldsville, because that is where Judge Tarbell is is, I think. And this is the judge that um, was the one that dismissed the uh, um, trial, the court against Joseph when he, they were saying that he was a, a rabble rouser and a money digger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, misleading all these people in the community. And he came out with a clean bill of health. And that was Judge Tarbell. And so Joseph returns there in South Bainbridge on January 18th, 1827, and that's where they are married. And Joseph, we had already talked about this a few weeks before, so I haven't gone into all the details, but Joseph's parents had already heard that Joseph wanted to marry Emma, and they said, when you marry, come up and, and stay with us. And so they do. They, they leave the Harmony area um, and go up to Palmyra and move in with Joseph's family. But the family has moved out of the log house by 1827. They're into the frame house, um, and there's a little bit more space. I'm sure Joseph is thrilled to be bringing her here, but it's still nothing compared to the home she was raised in. And I'm sure that stark difference was very difficult for her. We have a few accounts from a few records um, by other people that would suggest Emma um, had a very hard first few months of changing. You know, you can imagine she has the, the few things that she brought with her on an overnight um, trip or a couple of day week, a long weekend trip, and that's all, all she has with her. And that's why in the summer she writes her parents. 
Joseph's family home um, was sh- um, rebuilt and stripped down. And this is a picture in the process of, I am sure, when they lived there, the walls were painted very lovely. Um, but they had a very sweet, affectionate relationship. They were married because she loved him and he was smitten by her. And it's so dear to read um, their love stories. We have a lot of them in Dean Jesse's writings, um, where, in the personal handwriting of Joseph, so the letters that were written by Joseph. And that's another reason you say, how could she marry this guy if at the time he can't even write a coherent sentence, you know, and here she's this well-educated lady. Well, because I believe she was a woman of God. And I believe she was following the promise of God. And I believe that she thought Joseph was a prophet, that he was called of God, and she wanted to be part of that mission of bringing forth the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ on the earth to usher in the millennium, which we will talk about next week. Here's one beautiful quote from Joseph. With what unspeakable delight and what transports of joy swell my bosom when I took by the hand on that night my beloved Emma, she that was my wife, even the wife of my youth and the choice of my heart, the fatigues and toils and sorrows and sufferings and the joys and the consolations, undaunted, firm and unwavering, unchangeable Emma. Now, obviously he wrote this a few years later, but their love grew and it was tested in so many difficult, difficult, difficult ways. In all relationships, you're going to have testing. Uh, But whenever I feel like um, relationships are hard, I I look at their marriage and see what they did with it. And I admire immensely how they were able to learn and grow and the mutuality and equality that they established was not part of their culture. We don't have a lot of arranged marriages in America at this time, as many as we did in other parts of the world, but you still were encouraged to marry your parents' choice. You were still encouraged to marry within your socioeconomic. You were still encouraged to marry, et cetera, et cetera. You get the message. This is unique. But Joseph, I feel, um, was the first feminist in America, and um, it helped to have such a capable and talented wife, as well as inspiration from the Lord, because he is learning his views on women from the Savior, who I believe was the first feminist of all. And any church that claims Eve is a great woman and that claims, anyway, you you know what I'm talking about. Joseph restored a great place for women. And we see that not only in their relationship, but in what Joseph allows Emma. And sometimes I've heard people be frustrated that there's only one section to women in the Doctrine and Covenants. Why didn't his mother ask for one? Why didn't his um, sisters or his daughters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, oh, even one was an enormous step for that culture where women's voices were not heard. Women were not allowed to be legal witnesses at this time. They didn't own much. There were rare cases of them ever owning property, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the women did not have the rights that we are familiar with. And I believe that this was one of those turning stones. Um, The restoration was one of those turning stones and the rights of the women to speak in church and to be ordained under the hand of a prophet, as Joseph uses that word, I believe correctly. And one who receives so much responsibility is very unique. It is the first in the nation. And when we talk about um, women in the church, Joseph opened the doorway for many other faiths to follow with a place to women. I love the relationship between Emma and Lucy. It's just beautiful. Whatever her her hands were found to do, she did with her might until she went so far beyond her strength that she brought upon herself a heavy fit of sickness, which lasted for weeks. You know, I'm so glad to hear this part. I always read the last part of Emma's and um, Lucy's recollections and of their relationship, but this part is so good to me. She works her tail off and gets overly spent and needs to take a break. She's totally like the rest of us um, who perhaps overextend some time or feel that our responsibilities ask us to do more than we have physical strength to do and we have to take back and we have to learn how to balance our time and our talents and our energies. But this is one woman with zeal and she is willing to do all she can within her power. And then the Lord has to teach her um, there is a season for all things. And she has this heavy bout of sickness, which lasts for weeks because she's so worn down. 
And although her strength was exhausted, still her spirits were the same, which in fact had always been the case with her under the most trying circumstances. This just blows me away. Even when she's in pain, she is not a pain to live with. And even when she's sick, she is not emotionally or spiritually sick. This is just a fabulous account by a woman who also knew um, how to work hard. And I have never seen a woman in my life who would endure every species of fatigue and hardships from month to month and from year to year with that unflinching courage, zeal, and patience which she had always done. For I know that which she has had to endure. And I think there were very few who knew it as well as, as her mother-in-law. Um, and this is the part then we, that we usually hear that she had been tossed upon the ocean of uncertainty and that she was um, breasted with the storm of persecution and buffeted with rage of men uh, and devils and that she had been swallowed up in the sea of trouble which had been down almost any other, born down almost any other woman. And um, I want to go back to the time when she was asked to be, go with Joseph. And we just have a couple more years and then we're going to stop and leave the rest of her life for later. But remember when in 1823, when Oliver, when um, Moroni first told Joseph, you need to bring the right person with you. And, and initially it's his brother. And then he looks in the seer stones after his brother dies and a uh, second year later and he sees Emma. And we assume by the way the record falls that he sees Emma before the wedding. And this is why he um, tries so hard to win her over. Um, Emma is the right person, but why would the Lord, here's one of my questions, if the Lord said, bring Emma with you, why does Emma stay in the wagon all night while Joseph's up the hill? Why didn't, jo why didn't Emma get to go up the hill and see Moroni? I don't know, but why did he have to bring the right person? Why was this marriage relationship needed in order to get the plates? Well, that for me is the answer. Joseph needed the tutoring and the learning and the help and the emotional, spiritual, and physical support that Emma would provide in order to carry out the gospel. Joseph could not do it alone. Like Adam, he needed a companion who was his one before, which is my favorite translation of that Genesis version instead of help meet. Her, his one from before, his equal, taken out of the same DNA, taken from his bosom. Adam has an Eve and Joseph has an Emma as two equal partners in the Lord's work. And he could not carry out his mission without her beside him. She was the right person and she came. Joseph and Emma are blessed with many children, but many of them die. We know the story. I already talked to you about Alva coming to get it. Um, then they go down and stay in, in the beautiful home um, after they receive the plates. And they go down to Harmony and stay in the Hale beautiful home for a little while because another sibling is living in the prime land of this 13 and a half acres. But when that other sibling moves out, Isaac agrees to allow Joseph um, to buy the best 13 and a half acres on his property. And it's, um, it lets you know a little bit about the love that they have for Emma, that they are willing to give this. And they charge him $200. And we talked before about how Joseph um, and Oliver and Samuel Smith and Isaac Hale's signature is all on that same page when they buy the land. Um, they stay there back and forth for about three years before they have to leave. And... Um, this is the page that we had referred to before. Emma is one of the five female witnesses of the translation process and refers to handling the plates under her silk handkerchief, as we talked about before. And there's some beautiful videos on Book of Mormon Central on this if you'd like to see more. She says, I once felt the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable like thick paper and would rustle with metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb as one sometimes does thumbs the edges of a book. This tells me a lot about who Emma is. She did not take it off. Joseph asked her not to take off the handkerchief, not to take off the little linen cloth. Um, She's curious, but she's obedient, and she wants the Lord's blessings, but she believes, and she is a witness. Although I was an active participant in the things that transpired and was present during the translation of the plates and had um, a cognizant things as they transpired, it is marvelous to me, a marvelous work and a wonder, as much so as anyone else. 
um, a beautiful testimony in the later ends of her life, that very last few days when her son comes and asks her more questions and it takes her days to get these thoughts out. So take that in context. She says, I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writings of the manuscript unless he was inspired. For when acting as his scribe, your father would dictate to me hour after hour. And when returning after meals and interruptions, he would once again uh, begin where he left off without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. And I know that we this is a, a very well um, known statement by Emma, but it is so important to me that we understand not only her integrity, but her, her, her testimony and her witness as a female voice. Witnesses were not female, not only in the biblical times, but in early America. It's just, it's just fabulous. Um, we know that it was during this um, last trimester of her first pregnancy is when the 116 pages were done and she goes into that labor and loses that firstborn child and almost loses her life um, the day after Martin left. And she loses actually six of her 11 children, but two of them were adopted. So she delivers herself um, nine children, five of whom die. And um, for those of you that have lost a child, you know what that feels like. And for the rest of us, we can um, only empathize at a distance. But Emma comes from a generation where they understood that better than anyone else. I'll read two love letters and then I better stop. This is by Joseph, April 4th, 1839. If you want to know how much I want to see you, examine your feelings, how much you want to see me, and judge for yourself. I would gladly walk from here to you, barefoot and bareheaded and half naked to see you. I think it is a great pleasure and never count it toil. Um, he loved her dearly and she loved him. You may be astonished at my bad writing and incoherent manner, but you will pardon all when you reflect on how hard it would be for you to write when your hands were stiffened with hard work and your heart convulsed with intense anxiety. But I hope there are better days to come to us yet. I am ever yours. Affectionately, Emma Smith. This is the early Emma that we have volumes more. And in my handout, I have many, many, many more of their love letters back and forth, but we're out of time today. And the next thing we'll talk about in our next meeting is the second coming. Sections 27, 28, and 29 all refer to the eschatology or the study of the last times. And I um, look forward to sharing more thoughts with you then. Thank you.